So good morning again. So I'm trying to figure out uh, who's in the room a bit more. Uh, just a quick survey. How many people came because they're interested in consent? Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I've been talking about consent for a really long time, and no one's really ever been interested. So. <laughs> Surprise. I think this year it's become a popular topic because of the GDPR. Um, even when the GDPR came in, I was like, hey, consent's in, and people were just like, you know. Um, I used to start a conference and say, so withdrawing consent, you know, and uh, that would just scare all the businesses because they think that if people had the choice to withdraw consent, they'd lose all of their clientele overnight. Uh, so it's still a bit of a, a scare for some organizations, but I think it's because of lack of understanding. But, um, so I'll, I'll get on with my presentation. So really, um, the consent receipt and the work I've been doing for a long time is about privacy transparency. Uh, privacy records, uh, which is what you make a consent receipt from. Uh, the GDPR, which is something that um, I lobby for consent to be in for a very long time, and I know the authors as well. Uh, usable privacy uh, was really the reason for this because there's really a, a lack of way for people to actually use their privacy and there's just been these privacy policies that aren't usable by people and people don't care about what a company's privacy policy is, you know, and companies think, well, users don't care about privacy. Because, uh, um, and then the holy grail, or what, why, why are we doing this, what can happen in the future, and that's getting towards our big privacy rights management. So a bit of background, uh, consent receipt specification was put into the Cantera Initiative in 2014. <coughs> uh, it was contributed by Open Notice with the Privacy Transparency Lobby, um, and Open Notice continued on at MIT Media Labs. So we've been collaborating with them for quite a while. Uh, and the work was chartered when it was put into the Cantera Initiative to be put into ISO. So this week we're now going into uh, Version 1.1 is just about finished to go into a 45-day public IPR review. And at this point, um, when it's done, we get to start putting it into ISO. And ISO has been working on something called 29184, which is a security and notice best practice sort of document. And the consent receipt... Privacy receive, and consent. Privacy notices and consent. Uh, I think, yeah. Notice... Notice and consent, secu security, notice and consent. It's got security in there somewhere. I'll look it up. Um, but we've written this in conjunction with that. So we've, you know, these both of these documents and specs have been going on for the same time, and we're looking to, you know, leverage the ISO 29100 framework because a lot of work has gone into that framework. We're talking like decades. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of debates and all the fights over lexicons and all this stuff has already happened. So the topic and a lot of these concepts are definitely not new. Um, so yeah, yeah. ISO uh, 29100 privacy framework is free for download as well. You don't have to pay for it like you do with most other uh, ISO documents. <coughs> Typically the framework ones are free because they are the top of the umbrella for a whole series of, of standards that sit underneath that you do pay you know, 160 francs or whatever it's going to be each time. Mm. But, uh, yeah, ISO 29100, free for download, you find it online. It's sort of a teaser for ISO. <laughs> come, come in, we, well, I think it's because what's happened is they realized a lot earlier than anybody else is realizing, but, you know, privacy can't just be some uh, corporate framework. It's got to be open for people to be able to use it. It's not, you know, and I think that the industry doesn't really understand that. Uh, you know, but, Google and Facebook's uh, sort of pseudo privacy framework, which it had to be there because there hasn't been anything else. Um, and without that, you know, people wouldn't have had any sort of privacy controls or best practices. So what do I mean by privacy transparency? And I was specifically talking about, you know, privacy contact information, the purpose for sharing uh, personal information or for any, any type of privacy, the identity of the data controller, who the processes are, one information shared. So this stuff is really, you know, hard to get. It's been part of the laws for a really long time. It's not, 1998, the Data Protection Act in the UK, the directive in the EU um, says you have to have all this information 
for everything, right? Uh, and not just consent. But you try to go and get that information, it's very difficult. Uh, so we did a lot of research. Uh, this is some of the work that was contributed into ISO. It was originally from the International Security, Trust and Privacy, ISTPA. Um, and notice of consent are the most common uh, elements across all privacy instruments around the world. So all OECD FIPS organizations have notice of consent and they're the most consistent uh, in all of those laws. So they really look a lot like each other. And they have those privacy transparency requirements. So what we ended up doing is we started creating a consent receipt, which is really a core use case in privacy for explicit consent. And we brought together the um, core fields from all these uh, frameworks. Um, and then we put it into a format to make it machine readable. And when you start making privacy or consent uh, records machine readable, you can start doing stuff like making it usable for people. And usable privacy transparency is, is what I call privacy metadata. Uh, hopefully other people will call it that soon. Um, but it's, you know, uh, what, how many risks are there? How many purposes are there? How many people is this going to be shared with? Not what exactly is the sharing. You know, I think people just want to know at a glance what these things are. And they want to know it in a consistent way across platform, across com com countries, companies. Um, so that's the operational performance of, of rights. So I've done a lot of uh, privacy transparency research in my career. I used to be an academic. Um, I've done longitudinal studies on IoT, because IoT we used to call CCTV, uh, surveillance. I, I don't know, now it's called sharing and IoT. Somehow it's been transformed by the marketing industry. But it's still something that's been around for a very long time. Um, and our research has shown that uh, the compliance and privacy transparency has decreased over the last 10 years. It's actually going down. Uh, and it averages around 88% um, are actually have the basic minimum transparency requirements for privacy. And uh, research from last month that my company's done has shown that um, this hasn't changed. In the UK, there's a data controller registry. There's only 12% of organizations registered with that registry now. And uh, of those 12%, like 3% have a privacy contact information listed. So. The market hasn't changed, and it's still 88%, and it's probably not going to change until they get fined, you know, until there's a way and there's a path, because there's not a lot of operational guidance out there for organizations or companies on how to actually do this stuff. Uh, well, there hasn't been. Um, anyways, the GDPR brings in a lot more requirements than the ones that already exist, which are the ones that I was just showing. Um, and a lot of that has to do with, you know, being much more transparent with uh, people about what you're doing with data. So here's a list of some of the extra things that are coming in. Um, organizations have to update their privacy policies for GDPR, uh, and uh, they have to provide notices to people, and they have to keep track of these things. So before right now, nobody keeps track of anything. They can change anytime they want. Nobody has a clue of what the hell is going on with their data. And they, you know this is sort of by design, because companies don't know what they're doing with their data from day to day either. Right? So they're, you know this is... Uh, this mythical thing called consent has really just been a theory, and now we're going to start seeing it in practice in, in a much deeper level. So, new guidance for the GDPR, there's a lot of that coming in, so all of a sudden there's this new stuff, um, and companies got to start digesting it, and uh, people have to start working on it. And there's a lot of things here uh, that need to be operational and you know there's a big difference between laws and operational practices. Laws are sort of like a blunt force tool for the market and operational practices are, come out of uh, competition and market innovation which takes time. So this change isn't going to happen overnight. Uh, these laws have been moving from um, best practices to standards to directive to legislation for 30 years. A lot of privacy laws started with uh, standards. And uh, what I think the big difference really is is that we're moving from a self-regulatory market to a co-regulatory market. And self-regulatory means privacy policy. Uh, privacy policy is meant for companies to look at their internal practices, to tell the world this is what we do inside our company, not meant as a privacy notice. Uh, and they were never intended for privacy notices, but that's how they've been used because it's sort of the minimum requirement for transparency in order to say we have some sort of thoughts about privacy. Uh, 
But the co-regulation means that people can start complaining against companies for fines. Uh, and if people don't want to, nonprofit organizations or organizations specifically designed for that can start complaining to companies uh, about companies to regulators. So if a company isn't transparent, then they can have a complaint and they can be fined. Um, so co-regulation is really going to open the market up for trust frameworks, uh, trust marks, and industry code of conduct. And industry codes of conduct is really the opportunity to standardize uh, a lot of practices. So even if all these companies uh, were all of a sudden compliant, and every company just spent all this money on lawyers and did all this policy work, uh, it still wouldn't mean that privacy would be usable for people. And I think that's a really key impact. Um, that you know, it's really important to know that uh, privacy is really meant for usability, for, for people to be able to use it, or else it's not meaningful to anyone. Um, so in, a, in the new world, I think what, a big sign of change is that people aren't going to have to read privacy policy. Uh, because the law is you know, going to be standard for everyone. Public privacy should be a resource. Um, and in identity, uh, user managed access is like a protocol that enables uh, privacy from the user in enterprise. So that's a good way to look at, that's how I, I sort of look at user managed access. And UMA is sort of the sister work group to the consumer work group effort. So ultimately, uh, open, open standards bridge the gaps. Uh, shift liability. So we're going to see a shift in liability because right now, uh, or the reason why organizations aren't really transparent is because they don't want to be liable for practices that they don't know they're going to have yet because they're innovating. And uh, the GDPR really works on what exactly needs to be transparent, how much it needs to be transparent. And, uh, it opens organizations up to being more liable, but it also enables the use of standards, which organizations can push the liability onto a public resource like a standard, so that uh, organizations they say, well, you know, everyone's using these open standards, and these open standards are, are being used to reduce not only our liability, but also to be commonly used by people. And I think that's the, the big point. Um, yeah, it needs to be open. So I, I've been a big advocate of being open. So I call this uh, uh, Privacy 1.0, which is uh, May 25th. I think that starts co-regulation. Uh, that's when privacy really starts beginning in the market. I say up until now it's been best practices, uh, and they haven't been operational. And you know when, when people can start pressing one button, communicating with all the companies in the world, and saying give me my data, then you start seeing uh, some change in, in the power of, of who owns and controls data. Which brings us to the consent receipt. Um, so it's really consent receipt is a is something that I can go and ask any company. So for any type of sensitive data now already, uh, any OECD FIPS jurisdiction, I can say, please give me this data. You know, who's the perp what's the purpose, who's the identity um, of the data controller, who are the processors. And by law, in most jurisdictions, they have to tell you that already. So the consent receipt really has those requirements that companies have to be uh, transparent about, but they do it in a consistent and common format. So that organizations can use it. So uh, a good benefit of the consent receipt is that it comes out in a human readable format, uh, which is sort of like a text file which someone could look at and read, not necessarily human understandable. So there's a lot of uh, clients and things that are being built and being used, like Miko, who's not here yet, and DigiMe. They're sort of absorbing these and providing uh, an aggregate view that's more useful for people. And so this leads to the future of the consent receipt. So when you have this big data, and when you can be able to see all your data at once, um, you can see how many companies have this purpose, how many companies have this attribute. Uh, if there's a data breach, I can go, how many, com you know, how many organizations have that attribute that's breached? Then I can start controlling my own identity. We're starting to get stuff like sovereign identity. Um, so a consent receipt already is like 95%, it's like one field away from a subject access request. So you, when you give a receipt up front, you're actually giving the information for a subject access request to the user before they actually start using the service. 
And that subject access request has all the information the user needs to start using their rights. So uh, it enables basically uh, automated privacy rights management. <clears throat> so what's next? Um, so it's a multi privacy is a multi stakeholder thing. It's not like Cantera can go around and, and make privacy happen for the world, and uh, it's not something like a company can do themselves either. So until the market starts moving and until things start moving forward, uh, it's been very difficult to actually do a lot with privacy. But now what we're looking for is we're looking for a cross industry and uh, across standards, multi standards organization to create a privacy receipt 1.0 which would be a privacy receipt, which would be useful for all privacy contexts and for all justifications of processing. So that's what I'm starting to work on now. So when the version 1.1 goes forward to um, ISO, we're going to be calling for interest in the privacy receipt in the Consent Information Steering Standings Work Group. Steering Work Group, yeah. It's probably three months ago. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think it takes time. Um, we're talking about extending a core, so the consent receipt's got a core privacy format that's good around the world, um, and it's just really been focused on explicit consent. Now we're just going to do it for easier use cases, which is, uh, you know, for any other legitimate interest, uh, surveillance, IoT, all of these require privacy notices. So it uh, doesn't matter what context you have, you still need the same information that's in a consent receipt, except uh, it's going to be, the, just for consent, it's going to list what processing it is. And then there's also multiple justifications for processing personal data. So you can give your name, and your name can be used for six different purposes. Um, and how is an organization going to tell you that? And you know, so operationally, you know, there has been little thought that's gone into how privacy is actually going to work, especially at scale. Uh, and well, the market hasn't even started working on this. So. A lot of people are like, oh, no one's ready for it. You know, it's like, you know, give me a bit of a break. It's, it's, you know, this stuff takes time, and it takes collaboration, and it takes innovation. So, yeah, um, looking forward to uh, enabling the receipt to be formatted, to be extend, extended for all types of purposes. And I think Cantera is prepping for that capability. Uh, so that's what I'm looking forward to. And to kick it off, um, we're actually going to have an international privacy summit uh, for International Privacy Day. I'm organizing that this week. Uh, it's going to be focused on identity trust and standards, and we're going to be able to start talking about this. Um, so if anybody's in London, let me know. I'm going to uh, be pushing the link out to, uh, during the conference. In London, yeah. Thanks. Three minutes of questions. Yeah. All right. What can I get consent for? Uh, so, have so have you have you had any? Is a leading question. Have you had anybody um, express interest in actually implementing consent receipts commercially? Yes. No. We've got uh, one company that's implemented over four million users in the UK. Yep. We have many many companies uh, implementing consent receipts for years. Um, yeah, so there's a lot, a lot of uptake. Uh, I think, um, you know, it's sort, of, it's sort of a new technology in that the user side, even though it's meant for user transparency, the user side for how to visualize it using it on aggregate hasn't been done, and the UX around privacy hasn't been done, and that's because, uh, you know, in my opinion, you need uh, privacy metadata in order to make something simple and usable. I mean, people just want to be able to look and see, oh, 10 purposes, share with 20 people, I don't really have privacy now, or I do have privacy now. Like that's you know that's what people want to know. They don't want to know who all these people are and how many times you know. They want to be able to go and look in case something happens in the future. But uh, really, it's a lot about uh, just being able to give simple, concise, consistent messages to people about how much privacy do I have now. So the consent receipt is going to enable being able to see what my privacy is digitally and physically. You know that's the format. So I you know in this space. On my phone, I don't have any privacy, but I do have a lot of privacy in this room. So that's the sort of uh, transparency needed to start making it usable for people. Um, and I'm looking forward to that day. It's a good effort. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. So, is there any other questions? Are we have questions. Actually, do you want to do you want a couple of things? Um, do you want to briefly talk about the purpose, purpose specification? Also, maybe just a little bit on use of some of the terms of iconography. Sure. Yeah. So, a big hole in privacy uh, has always been that any company can go and define the purpose any way they want. So it could be the same purpose, but you won't know that. You have to, a user would have to go and read each purpose and then assess themselves if it's the same purpose as this other company or as this other organization or as other context. And so that's really difficult because no one's ever going to do that. And companies can pretty much just say whatever purpose they want. So this is still a big problem. So all these laws really amount to that massive loophole uh, that until there's some sort of uh, standards around purpose, then you know, privacy still isn't much bullshit. For, for users because they won't get them. So I think uh, um, what we're doing now is we've got a proposal through for a paper on purpose specification, which is how do you specify purpose in a global context? So that right now privacy is really defined for local context. Uh, it's defined about uh, you know what it's not meant for an internet. It's not meant for scale. So being able to categorize what purpose means just you know. For example, uh, it's finances for my credit information. I uh, share my account details. So under a purpose category, it would be finance. So you know, that just makes it a lot easier for people to know all of this finance data being taken. Uh, so the purpose category is, a, is how we're attacking that problem. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. And that's a really big deal for marketing, because uh, marketing is going to have a big problem with um, definitely with consent and with legitimate interest and when do we do what, for what processes do we do legitimate interest, uh, managing data and what process do we need consent for. And I think uh, being able to just uh, categorize, you know, if you're buying media, um, you need uh, consent, if you're selling media, uh, you, know, you need legitimate interest. And I think there's a, some tests there and a lot of uh, industry uh, confusion right now in the market. Oh, the other one was uh, brief use of submitted terms uh, and how that plays into consent with the, yeah. uh, with the icon. So, do not trade. so identity management is about access control. So you get permissions. So you might have a, a bunch of permissions add up to consent. And uh, for users to be able to understand privacy, what you need is sort of like one icon that wraps up a bunch of permissions a bunch of access, a bunch of sharing into one thing, which is used all the time. So I can send to authorize uh, UMA for finances, right? That's got a lot of very long, the consent receipt would be like this, no one will ever read it, but you could sum that all up into one icon. Uh, and a user would then with that, with that framework be able to present preferences at it. Uh, so the user submitted terms is looking at compiling all those into industry standard terms and being able to enable people to then assert their own preferences in the context. So that's uh